Truth and Tea with the Urban Evangelist. Welcome to Truth and Tea with the Urban Evangelist. I am very excited today. I think it could be the fact that it's 1st of March and we are marching into the Women's Month. And you know, it's just a time to just appreciate and celebrate all that we are as women and you know, his unique design for us, you know, and just really embrace that and bring it to the fore. And so today's episode is one that I think will encourage every woman out there because it's all about being able to rise up when life just, you know, throws so many things at you that you feel you don't even know where to begin to pick up the pieces from. But yeah, a little more about that after I introduce my guest. I am the Urban Evangelist. Welcome to Truth and Tea, the podcast that filters life through faith. And joining me today is a beautiful lady that I've grown you know, to know and love on a personal level. She's a marketing guru, marketing enthusiast, but she's also done some great things for me as the urban evangelist in terms of managing the brand. Her name is Sandra Piri. Welcome to the show, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me in front of the camera this time. Right, exactly. You're always so busy behind the camera and behind the scenes. But I thought to throw you in front of the camera this week because you've got an incredible story to tell. And um, I would love to use your story, you know, as a propeller to just help someone who's struggling with Mm. what's on their plate right now Mm. and what's on the table. And it's not, um, you know, a sob sob episode in that, of course, we're dealing mostly with life after loss. But for me, it's just to celebrate how you've, you know, walked your journey with such grace, with Mm. such strength. So much so that I told you that, you know, you Remind me of a modern day superwoman. You don't have to wear a cape to show your superpower on a daily basis. So just a brief background. Um, Sandra lost her husband and she lost a daughter within a short space of time. Uh, You lost your husband first. I lost my husband first in 2017. 2017. November, yes. After having been married for three years. For three years, yes. And then... Shortly after that, shortly after about, that, well, like from my lens, I, yeah. I feel I've experienced loss like in this short space of time three times, three times. because our daughter had a heart problem. Mm. Then my husband died in 2017 November, and then mm. two years after she had a brain injury. So mm. I look at that as I lost her because, like, after the brain injury, she was not the same child, child. that I had before. So technically for my daughter, I feel like I lost her twice. So in 2019, she had the brain injury. So I lost this version of her that I knew and was warming up to the new one. Then I lost her like the final death in 2021, uh, November as well. So yeah, it's been a lot. And I think it sounds, it sounds easier to say that you lost them perhaps within a four year period. Yes. But for you who's experiencing it, you kind of lose sense of time. time. Exactly, totally. My, yeah. my time and what you are going through, you yes. know, in that moment. It's a lot, yeah. Uh, are very different. It's very different. I remember to... I had um, a car incident recently. So as I was talking to the traffic officer, he, because the car is still in my, hus- my late husband's name. So he mentioned, oh, the, the car is not in your name. I was like, oh, yes, it's not. So I said, then he said, then we'd need the, the, the person who uh, it's in the name of. And I was like, oh, that's my late husband. And he was like, it's been five years. Why didn't you get it changed? And it's only then that he mentioned that mm. it hit me. I was like, it actually has been a long time. Because my son, whom, like when he was dying, I was left three months pregnant. Is, will be turning five. So like if you were to look at it as a life, it's a whole talking child, he's walking, he's doing everything. So it has been a long time and I also didn't realize it until someone mentions it, then I'm like, oh, it actually has been a lot, but a lot has happened that I honestly, for me, I have moments where I'm still in 2017 and I'm talking to the doctors and they're saying a few hours after I take my husband into the hospital that mm-hmm. he's already been dead. So I have moments when I'm there, then I have moments when I'm with my daughter and they're saying she has a brain injury or these moments and like, okay, she's dead. So it's like everything, I can't really tell them apart sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll take you right back to the very beginning. I remember when I heard about your husband's death, 
I, I knew him as Jack Bot. Yes. I knew him as the creative the brain creative. behind Pompey's oh, video videos. Silence. Because yeah. I'm a huge Pompey fan. Mm -hmm. And to just being finalized, I think, yeah. if I'm yes. not mistaken. Yes, and been, yeah. just to hear that, you know, the talent behind this video is not with us anymore. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was very sad, you know, to learn of the news. Yeah. But then where I'm going with this is that... Um, I've come across a quote that says that, you know, when you lose a husband, there's a, a name for that, like you yes. become a widow. Yes. But when you lose a child, it's so inexplicable it that is. there isn't a term for that okay. yet. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's just memes until you experience exactly. something. Until you're going so for you, it. would you say there's been a distinction in how you've dealt with loss as a spouse and loss as a parent? Um, well, like I, I would liken it to like having kids because I experienced having both kids. And I know this before they say, I'm not quite sure about the whole favorite child thing. Right. I think they're all unique in their own way and you love them, all of them. Yeah. You love all of them. Like if you have more than one kid, you love yeah. all of them in their own unique way, not that you love one more than the other. Mm. So for me, I would say they are, like I can't really say there is a distinction, but these things are a bit, not really different. I, I guess the heaviness of it sits different, for lack of better terms, mm. yes. But it still borders within the same thing, like, like how you can't say you have a favorite child. It's mm. the same like how there isn't one that I would say is greater than the other, right. but the, the, these things are obviously, yeah. And for me, it's blurry because for my daughter's death, it happened like there, there was a lot of other things that happened before she actually passed on. So maybe it's the number of things that also led to her death that make it hit a whole lot different. Yeah. yeah, because there was a lot of faith. There was a lot of hope. There was a lot of, because when I went through my husband dying, I had a period where I was mad at God and I was not talking to him. And then very quickly- Would it be around that period when, when he died? Yes, yes. Okay. so because what had happened like when my daughter got sick, then the first time the doctors saw her from South Africa, they said, you can't do anything to help her because you brought her in late, apparently, and all of those things. But then God saw her through everything, and her healing was quite quick compared to the condition that she had. So God, like, brought her through this, and there was a building of faith. Like, it was just the relationship that we had with God. And now that I have grown in the experience, I appreciate it now because I feel even when my husband, by the time he was dying, there's a relationship with God that he had that was unmatched. He knew God as the God who answers prayers and he comes through. Like there was, there was just a building of relationship that was just crazy. But then for me, it was a whole 360 very fast because from coming up there with God can do it, he's able to, he'll always provide, he'll always heal, he'll always do that to your husband just dying after a few hours of saying he has a headache. Then I was lost. I was like, what? why, what's going on, mm. what happened? Because in my mind, after they had mentioned that uh, this is the condition your daughter has, yeah. there was thoughts of, if we do the surgery, what if she dies? So when it came to death, of course the thought of death came, but never for my husband. Like he was the last person I'd have ever thought would die. In my mind, I never saw a 28 year old dying. Like it just, it couldn't register, yeah. Like, and from a headache, so it, it never registered. So. There was that period where I was like very close to God and then my husband died and I detached. But then again, very quickly, as a way of healing, and that's what helped me, I got close to God again. Yes, and so then... So when, when your husband died, you were yeah, pregnant? I was pregnant, yes. And uh, then you were also dealing with your daughter's condition. Exactly, with the, dealing with the brain, yes, the brain injury. So I, I knew that I was not going to be able to do this on my own, and I needed God because really he's the only one that I've ever known for the longest, and I, I just you're the only one who can help me. So there was me getting back to God and regrowing in the faith and all of these things happening, and then my daughter's condition kind of getting better and then getting worse. So there was that shift in, in my relationship with God, and then because of all of these things that I went through, because I saw him come through for me, yeah. all of that hope, I held it on to, she's gonna be fine. Like I never, for, like it now moved from me being scared, like oh, the next surgery she might die because she kept on having uh, doctor reviews uh, every six months. And then there was talk of having surgery again, like in the next two years. It moved from being, 
because I saw God provide for my children, and, and I had like a self-deliver. I always thought I was going to lose my child, uh, my son, that is. So I then I was like very focused to say, this is going to work, and she's going to heal. That is the path that I was on, because I'd seen God bring me through. So I said, there is no way she is going to heal. Then when she died, it was just a whole different thing that my head had to process. Yeah. How old were you when your husband died? I was 26. You were 26. I was 26. I was, you were very young. Yeah, I was. And um, to have a term like widow placed on you at that age, it was how, very... how, how, how did that, how did you deal with that? Yeah, so like I was, I, I don't know if I could term it because I think there's different phases to, mm -hmm. to when things are happening to you, you're going through different phases. I know the, the internet and people have all of these stages of, of grief, grief, and I disagree because I like grieving is not, and healing also is not linear. There's moments I wake up and I feel so much better. Sometimes mm -hmm. it could go on even for a week. I feel like I'm so much better, I'm in a better place. I think the certain steps I've taken that have brought me to where I am, and then it would just be one small thing that triggers me, and then I'm back folding again on the floor and just trying to get a hang of what is all of this that is happening. So for me, I never even took off my ring after my husband died. So the whole widow time is something that, like, it, I, like even someone to say it, yes. I, I, like it, I couldn't even process it, it was too heavy for me. In my mind, there would be times and moments when I was convinced my husband would pop up from somewhere, somehow. I kept my ring on, and I kept my Mrs. Sikanika, because I'm Sandra Perry, but he was Sikanika, so I was Mrs. Sikanika. Like, even when I'm going for work and there's interviews or I'm meeting a client, I'd always say, hi, I'm, I'm Mrs. Sikanika, and I'd have my ring on. And I think there was a lot of denial also, because I think maybe for a greater part, I thought maybe healing is just to sit on the pain, to not mm. deal with the pain, but mm. to just sit on it, tuck it away, and it, it, it will somehow go away. If in my mind it's not true, then let's move with what's in my mind, yeah. So, yeah. And how long did it actually take you before you removed your wedding ring? I removed my wedding yeah. ring in 2020. That was three, three years, years later. Three years after my husband died. And that was after my daughter had the brain injury because then after she had the brain injury, she lost like all motor skills, all cognitive skills, everything was gone. She was not able to talk, she wasn't able to swallow her saliva, she was not she couldn't recognize me. Like I went to the hostel with a a child who couldn't shut up, like all the nurses knew her and all the doctors knew her to leaving that place to a child who could not do anything at all. So then initially when it happened, and always as my first response, it was, I was like, God, because God is the only one I have always known. So then I, I also had a period where I, I have never prayed for anyone as much as I've prayed for my daughter. Like, I just, yeah, like, I, I went all out. I was fasting, I was praying, and then that in itself got me closer to God. And then that started to shift my perspective because I realized in that moment that, and I've heard this before, I think I had a conversation with a friend about it, about how... Sometimes when something similar keeps on reoccurring in your life, it's because God is trying to teach you something and you're not getting the lesson. So I kept on dealing with loss and I was trying to understand, like, God, what do you want me to do? How should I position myself? What am I doing wrong? Am I not praying enough? So I then realized very quickly that it was that I was not letting go of my husband and I was not completely bearing myself open to God to, to rely on him totally. So I took that shift, and that is how I then removed my ring, because I said, look what, I am yours, I get it, I am yours, and I'm not going to hold back, you're my husband, you're my provider, you're my protector, you're everything. So then that is the moment when it became a bit easier for me to even take off the ring, and for me to stop calling myself Mrs. Sikanika and all of those things. It's only when I got to that point mm -hmm. when I was able to do that, yeah. Was it like, so it was a bit symbolic for you to take yes, it off? It, yes, it, it marked, was. Um, the next step exactly. to say exactly. in your journey with, you know, just, you know, dealing with grief. Dealing with grief, dealing with loss, dealing yeah. with this yeah. new thing that has happened. Yeah. That was really like, and like you said, it was like, um, like a next step of my life. Because then even, like I hadn't been to church since my husband died. I hadn't been to church. Then after I took off my ring, I think that must have been like in probably August. Mm -hmm. In September, I was back in church. 
I even started to, um, like I did a foundation class and all of those things, yeah. So then I was growing into what, I, I think I'd gotten to a place where I had a bit more, for lack of better terms, peace and a better understanding of maybe this is what God wants me to do. Maybe this is how I should position myself, maybe. So it was a bit easier and clearer for me at, the, yeah. at that point in time, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll get to more of that um, in a few minutes, but I wanna take you back uh, to you know, the time I gave you a call and just trying to um, get the timeline right of yes. the losses. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something that really stayed with me. You said, you know, ever since the losses, you seem to have blanked out on certain parts of your life. Yeah. So I just want to know what has been the impact of your losses on your physical well-being? You know, mm. what, what did you go through? Yeah, yeah. It's been a lot. It's amazing how the body reacts to you when you're emotionally upset. And that's a thing that I didn't know because, oh, like it's been a lot. Mm. I have lost my hair a lot. Like I remember in 20, I think it was 2020 itself, if not 2021, I just literally had to cut everything and start afresh. It just started falling off. It was, I had chunks, like you could trail me in the house. Really? Everywhere I sat, when I'm getting up, there would be hair. So initially when it started, I thought it was because I was pregnant. So the postpartum, I, I went through it with my, with my daughter, with Alexis herself, I went through it. My hair started to fall off after, like I think about three or six months after I delivered. So after I had my son, I said, oh, it's postpartum. And then I was trying to like treat it the same way that I had treated it with my daughter. And then uh, they, like it just kept on getting worse, getting worse, getting worse to lack of sleep. So like I had, I've always suffered though with like insomnia, but then it became worse because like after my husband died, I had a period where like I just couldn't sleep. I, if it, if I'm to, not just- Just to insert another follow-up question to yeah, that. I, yeah. I'm the sort of person and um, not to make this about me. Yeah. Like even if we're in the house together, as long as he's not in the bedroom, yes. in the bed, it's hard I can't to sleep. sleep. Yes, so exactly. I can imagine now that yes. he's gone, you know, <clears throat> yeah. how much more that was heightened. It was, it was so bad. And worse, like I was, like you mentioned, like, like even well, between my late husband and I, he was the one who was more on the physical touch bit. So like he would always want to be around you. And I got used to that. It was easier for me to, to, to live like that. So there was processing that. And then there was just me being pregnant and uncomfortable and just wanting someone to be there. And all of that wasn't there. So there was the insomnia, there was the loss of hair, the, there was the drastic weight loss. It's weird, and people don't even believe me now, but I was obese at some point in my life. Like, I was really big. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> I know, and a lot of people don't, but those who know me know, like, I was really big. So, yeah, I never got as big as I was when I was younger, but then obviously there's just a, a time when, especially after my son was born, I had to literally stop breastfeeding him because I was just losing so much weight. There was the weight loss, there was the hair loss, there was the insomnia, there was my skin breaking out. It, and sorry, like I had moments where I was just feeling sick, like my whole body would just be sick, like all the time. And I'd go to different hospitals and they'll just be like, maybe you're stressed, maybe, yeah. So there, there is a lot that happens to, the, to one's body when you're going through something emotionally. I've seen it. And medically, were there any solutions that were thrown your way, which, um, Sometimes tend to, I know there's some people that have um, an issue, especially in Christian circles. With therapy. With, with therapy, mm. with taking antidepressants. Mm. Were you given any of those solutions that you know, could have helped could have, could have helped. you? Well, not necessarily. Also because I think, I, I have gone for therapy like, I'd say roughly three times, but then also like I never completed all of these sessions. So the first time, was after my daughter had the brain injury, when Alexis had the brain injury, so the hospital organized someone to you know, have these therapy sessions with me. So I only had, I think, about two with her and I wasn't comfortable because again, I think stemming from this place where you think as a Christian, it's not like a really the right thing to do. 
So I was never really open to it. So it didn't feel right to it do it. It didn't feel right for me to do it. I, not, so you I couldn't, couldn't get the really help right, because, but like, I didn't mm. think it was necessary. Okay. In okay. my mind, I was like, I'm praying about this, and God is going to work it out. So I don't really think I need you to do this. Mm. In my mind, that is okay. what it felt like. But then when I started going to church, our church provides, they have a therapist there as well. So one of the pastors said, you know what? And they're also talked to me about therapy in a way that I understood that God has placed so many people with so many talents, the Bible talks about it, and he uses these people to help you. So it will not be just you getting, it's the same way like you're getting a panel because you have a headache. Yeah. Your emotions will also need that sort of attention. If you see someone, like we're, we're both sitting and I'm bleeding, you'd want to do something to of help course. it. And when you take them to the hospital, they'll do something to treat it the, the same way. It's the same with our emotions. You experience loss, you're going through <clears throat> a divorce or something. Somewhere, somehow, your emotion is bleeding. If you equate it to it being a physical thing, you're bleeding somewhere, you're hurt somewhere. Why can't you <clears throat> go to the hospital and get someone to see it and give mm -hmm. you the help? If it's a band aid that has to go there, if they have to clean it up first, medicate it a little bit, and then put the band aid, is yeah. the same process with therapy. So when I started to look at it in that lens, I then understood and said, I think this would be helpful. And I had two, three sessions, and then my daughter died. So then now it took me it back took again. You back. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I like uh, where you've left us, though, um, in terms of the conversation that we're having. Mm. When you talked about, you know, when you can see an outward wound, yes. it's easy to do something about <clears throat> yeah. it. Yeah. And it, it, it takes me back to the difference between mourning and mm. grieving. And, grieving exactly. and I now understand why the Bible says mourn with those who mourn. Yes. Because mourning is, you know, an external yes. expression. Yes, it's, it's almost like you know, a byproduct. Yes, exactly. yes. Of, of, of so it's grieving. easy for someone to mourn with you because I can cry with you. Yes. But when it comes to the aspect of grief, it's that's different. like an internal wound an internal that no one can help no, you're, you're, you know, bind yeah. up. Have you been good at exposing what's on the inside? No, I haven't. And it's something that I have struggled with for a long time. And that's one of the reasons why, like even for, like I, I did, we had a whole fundraise for Alexis, mm. for her health. She had the brain injury in 2019. Um, even the, clo like even my best friend did not know she had a brain injury. That's how... Really? That's yes, how closed that's up how closed up were. I am. Yeah, yeah. Or I was, rather, because I'm working towards it. And it's amazing now that I get people say, because I'm very open about my story now and my journey, there's moments when I have a bad day, and I will, I will share it, because I'm thinking if there's someone out there who's going through this and they have been in a place like mine where they feel they have to go through it alone when they're the only ones, because grieving and loss and all of these things and just life's hardships have a way of tricking us into believing we're the only ones going through it and that we're not seen, we're not valued, we're not heard. So I was, I was never the type who's, who's open about anything. So I kept that for a very long time and that is the reason why I only, we only did that fundraise two years mm. after after she had the brain injury. The, the fundraise was in 2021. The fundraise was okay. in 2021. She and, had the injury um, in 2019. I remember that, yeah. you know, and I'm glad that you've touched on that because it's one of the things that I was, you know, coming to. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, finding that courage to go public, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with the fact that this is what you're dealing with with your daughter. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, also, um, you know, put together, like, you know, a funding pool to be able yes. to get her the help that she that needed. She needed. Yeah. Where did that courage come from? Because it's, it's not the easiest thing to do, you yeah. know, and um, I will ask a very hard question here, mm. you know, in that there was also funding yes. that was required. Yes. It can't be easy to ask for help, no. especially you know, from, 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 from public and, and well wishes. And also the type of person that I am. That you <laughs> yeah, are. Or that I was. Based because, on what you're telling me. Exactly, exactly. yeah. I was the where kind. Did the, where did that ooh, courage and like, boldness come from? When I tell you that when, when, you, when we ask God for something, we must be very careful. I read something once that said, when you ask God for strength, do not, like, don't expect to have some strength that will come from somewhere. He will, like, you will go through an experience that will literally drag you, and you, it will require you getting up for you to know you've actually gotten that strength. I was the kind of person who, I have people in my phone book who, in an instant, I would ask for something, and I would have it in one minute. They were that willing to help me. They would even, 
I have friends who just send me the money or send me help yeah. without because they knew the kind of person that I was. I remember one time um, after, like, my son was about two weeks old and he's a winter baby. So he was born on the 23rd of May, which was the same day that my husband and I got married. Wow. So, yeah, he was born on 3rd May and, like, two weeks into it was June. And what I didn't know is that the, the, where I was working, they did agree. They got me when I, I was pregnant, so I had to go on maternity leave real fast. Then they said we were fine. But what I didn't know is that they were going to half my salary. So when it came, I had already at some point paid my daughter's school fees. So the way I had budgeted it, I was short on, like, I, I didn't have electricity that night. I had a phone full of contacts of people who could help in a heartbeat. I could not text anyone to ask them for help at all. I slept in that cold house with a two weeks old baby and one who has a heart problem because I just couldn't ask for help. That's how bad it was. Like, it was cold, like I was freezing and in my mind I kept on thinking, Sandra, do you think this is worth it? Mm. And at that point, I told myself, I said, God, this is pride. You've talked about pride and I need you to help me deal with this. It was just what to me seemed like a very short prayer. It wasn't even anything necessary. And two years down the line, I found myself asking the whole of Zambia for help. If, if there is something that would deal with pride, it's that. Like it's, it'll put you in check with your pride real quick because you're literally telling people you're going nights without eating, you're, you, you, you have moments where you don't have any money and you're just telling you, look, this is what's happening. It's not the easiest of things. So for me, it, it took a lot. It, it took a whole lot. I was, and I think it was just God, really, because I, I, I'd never seen myself ever doing it. Apart from me asking for help and telling people that I'm actually struggling, it was also people will now see what Alexis is like now. Yeah. Because I think in my mind, I hadn't really fully processed it. Yeah. People always knew her as the talkative girl. The, you know, there's the, the, the certain way that she was in at some point, and then now she was, for lack of better terms, disabled. So I was like, people will now know. So those, all of those things, but then, again, what I learned from this process was God was just... I, I think the relationship between God and us, the relationship he requires of us, is for us to be vulnerable and open. I think this is something that I had been a Christian for a very long time, but I feel the certain things we tell ourselves as Christians that I need to act a certain way, or I can't have days when I, I don't have faith because it's not Christ-like, but God already knows these things. So if you're not bringing it, if you're not telling him, like any relationship, like I was married before, and I know one of the things that strengthened our relationship, our marriage, was how close and vulnerable we were with each other. I'll, I'll talk about like having a child, for example. There's times when I know my son has done something wrong mm -hmm. because he'll come to me, and just from his body language, I can tell that there's I'm something. Yeah. So sometimes I'll ask her, so what did you do? But sometimes I'll just keep quiet and see if he's going to tell me. And I think God wants that from us. Like he wants us to tell him. He knows that there's something wrong. He can see it or he knows, but he wants you to have a, bear yourself open. You're not happy with him, tell him. There's something, but tell him whatever. Like for my, like I keep on, I t call myself God's favorite daughter because God even knows he's tired of me. Like I, <laughs> any minute, anything, like I will yeah. just, like we are friends like that. And I, I had, it was a process for me to get to that place. Yeah. And the certain things that others would term as courage, but I, I, it's not, it wasn't even for me, it wasn't from me, it was God helping me do that. So I, I prayed and said, God, let's deal with this pride, yeah. and there it was. And it's amazing how um, I think there was an overwhelming response once and you put it out there. that is what I didn't there. see. Like, I, I never um, thought, because in my mind I say, yeah. it's a lot of money, and people want help, but then I would have told my story, and I've told people that I'm going through all of these things for nothing. But had I known sooner, I always tell myself, and it's one of the things that, like, I regret. How many to days now. did it take to raise three the days. Just three days. Just yeah, three I days. Because I remember keeping yeah. tabs on yeah. that, yeah. and it, it just amazed me days. how quickly the help came yeah. through. Yeah. yeah. And it how much took, was raised in three days? We raised about a four hundred and fifty thousand kwacha, which was enough to, to then send enough, her for surgery. Yeah, to send her for surgery, okay. and it okay. helped us also get some equipment that she needed to like yes. better herself. So, like, to, to better the condition that she was in at that point in time. Yeah. So, I, after that happened, then I realized that we were actually able to get this help. I wish I'd done it sooner, 
to get her the help sooner because I did see how much of a great difference it made. Mm -hmm. But then, in, like, we did the fundraise in March and in November she died. Yeah. Did you ever feel misplaced guilt because you delayed? Yes, a lot. Even, even now, like, till today, I have moments where I'm just like, I, I didn't do enough. And, um, yeah, like, people will say... Um, no, you did a lot. Like you literally. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, it's okay. I'm getting emotional. No, yeah, it's okay. Um, yeah, people will say like you did a lot. You, you. So people say I'm strong and um, they say like, oh, you did a lot and you know, like you put your whole life on hold for her, but I feel if it was enough, maybe she'd still be here. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot, there's a lot of guilt and regret. Like I feel maybe if, you know, like we had known sooner, because when she was a baby, she'd be the certain way, and we did notice it. We didn't know. Yeah, so there's so many things, there's so many emotions that I get to deal with every single day. Like, I would be on a... She's healed now. She's not going through any pain. She's okay, so it should be okay. To why did she have to go through all of that? Like, if, if God knew it was going to end in death, like, it wasn't necessary, yeah. especially the last two years of her life. Like, yeah. yeah, he shouldn't have let her go through all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's amazing how um, I find some of what you've just said very relatable mm -hmm. because what I haven't shared with you is that in November, our daughter was in hospital dealing with her second hospitalization. Mm -hmm. And we used to pray for Alexis May, Lena and I. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were standing with you in prayer, as I'm sure a lot of people were, you yes. know. And I think we're so heavily invested emotionally, mm -hmm. even without really knowing you <clears throat> yes. then, as well as I know you now, because, yes. you know, I didn't know you. Yeah, we did. Then. We did know each other. Um, and then when the news broke that, you know, she died, we cried so much, Lena and I, yeah. like we really cried. Yeah. And it was the following month that we also lost, lost Lena on yeah. Christmas day. Yeah. And when you say, you know, that you feel like, you know, she went through so much and humanly possible, you made every effort and only to lose her, you yeah. know, it kind of makes you question, but then why go through all that, exactly. you know? So in that moment, what was your relationship like with God and how did you pick yourself up like, from there to go back to having faith, trusting yeah. and believing yeah. all over again? For me, it was just, I was like, you know what? God, I have tried. Like the first, like, like I mentioned, like after I took off the ring and I, I went back to church again, like I was, and that's the same thing that happened when, before she had the brain injury. After I lost my husband, I was getting to a place where I decided to say, you know what, I lost him, this is what happened, and I was not really like making peace with it, but accepting it. And I, was, I felt like I was in a better place in terms of accepting that this is what has happened, and I'm now moving forward, I'm, I'm learning from this pain. I, at the point, I thought that was like, you know, the only pain. And then she had the brain injury, then again I went back, and then, she, like in the brain injury, I got the courage again and the faith and I said, you know what, God, I get it. This is about you. We're going to do this this way. I'm going back to church. I'm taking off this ring. I'm doing what? And then she died. So like I even started therapy because all of that was me being intentional about my healing and 
being intentional about growing my relationship with God. I went back to church, did foundation class, and then she died. And then I just said, God, you know what? That's fine. It, that's it. I get it. I, I, I guess that you, that you have people that you do these things for, and some of us are probably just would never be cut out for it. You have your own favorites, for lack of better terms. Mm. So you work with those. For me, I'm okay. It's okay. And I never wanted anyone to mention God. I had so many people. I, and then in that moment, I had people who started to judge me with how I was, re how I was reacting or processing. So they're like, no, you can't. Like, I would have moments where I'm saying, but why did he? And others would say, don't, you can't question God. Don't, as a Christian, you can't question God. You can't say that. I know you're upset, but you can't. So then that even just fueled the hurt mm. even more. Mm. Like, I just, I, I didn't want anything to do with anyone from church or anything. I just said, let me just keep to myself and let me do things in my own way. Because it looks like God is not going to come through for me. He has his people, so let's just... Leave it at that. But then again, that was, I think, maybe sometime in like April. The April more, last year? Yes, April okay. last year. Like I had moments where um, it still wasn't working, but still a void that I was feeling. So because there's certain information that I already have in terms of who God is and what he's doing and all of these things, I, I knew there's certain answers and the certain feeling that I needed, like, like to fill the void that could only come from him. So in that, I found myself inevitably going back to the word and then asking myself, maybe I didn't, maybe there's just something I haven't like properly understood. So, okay, maybe let's do this again, God. Like, let's, let's try again. Because I tried, this, I had even tried going to, like getting into, I think they call it the new age thing where they believe in everything because I had some friends who were telling me, you know, there's the Buddhist, the heal like this, it'll help you heal, it'll help you do what. So I had, I was trying it, but then there's still, it was even making me feel more displaced and more unease yeah. and more, like lack of peace was even getting greater at that point in time. Then I knew within me something was wrong. Yeah. I knew something was wrong and then I just said, okay, let me go back because the only way I feel this is right, the only way I feel like I'm almost myself is just back with him. And then I had to start regrowing the relationship all over again. Yeah. It's beautiful to see with, you know, yeah. how passionately you're serving him now. Yeah. Like that's just incredible. Yeah. Very quickly, have, has the, cross, the thought of moving on, remarrying, having more children crossed your mind? Like before Alexis had the brain injury in 2019, yes. Like I had the thought of, you know, it had been two years since my husband died. So I, I was like, it wouldn't be such a bad idea because I have moments where I, I turn to miss loving someone and them loving me back and the whole process. So I was like, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to probably get into a relationship. And then she had the brain injury. So I had to go through my own things and also like helping her heal and all of those things. But then now, like at this very moment, having a kid is what's like top of my mind. Like it's like, I think there isn't a day I wake up and I'm not like, oh, it would be so nice to have a baby. Yeah, like every time I see you with a bump, I was always like, oh, So you're more so broody nice. than yes, you know, in need of a relationship. Exactly, and that is where the problems are. I'm like, of course, we're going to come from. But yeah, yeah like that's really, I, I feel the quality of humans have changed around in terms of dating. Yeah, because yeah. my husband and I, and that is also one of the things, like he was, I think, one of a kind. The way things are structured now, I, and it's hard to almost not, like not really compare per se, but just coming from that place to getting to another one and just totally trusting who this person will be. It's like a very difficult shift for me right now, even just to process it, yeah. Yeah. You get there. Yes. When the time's right, <laughs> it the will time be right. Is right. Yeah. Sandra, in, in, in closing, I just want you to look into your camera and you know, I'd love for you to just Speak to a woman that's hurting, mm. that's dealing with loss. And loss isn't just death, exactly. you know. It's divorce. It can be divorce, it can be loss of, you know, a job, yes. loss of your identity. Exactly. You know, it can be so many things. Mm -hmm. But um, since we're talking about the ability to rise up, you yes. know, and you've done it under the most, you know, grueling mm. circumstances, you've, you've actually done it. Yeah. 
you know, and I want you to give yourself a pat on the back <laughs> for that, you know, and when, you. when, you, when you're alone, just yeah. pat yourself on the back and thank yeah. God for the work that he's done. But I just want you to speak to a woman out there that just needs that push to rise up. Yeah. Well, honestly, I think the first thing is that I feel as when, when someone has created something, like, um, like if I create a machine, for example, I'm the one who's created it. I know how it has to work and how it has to run. Whoever buys it will always either need to read something that I've written down on how to use this machine or will have to talk to me. So what I've come to learn from my own experience is that it's not really about you. It's about the story God is telling through you. And once you connect to God, everything will be so much easier. I know you're hurting right now. I know it's hard. But just be kind to yourself. Give yourself time and grow that relationship with God. And eventually, he'll be able to help you with strength that when he says, I'll give you peace that surpasses all human understanding, even I get to places where I don't understand how I'm still able to function and do what I'm doing despite everything that has happened to me. But when you do that, when you just surrender yourself completely to God, no matter how crazy it feels like right now, he is there. When you get to a place where you surrender yourself, things will be so much easier. And you're able to do it. You're able to rise up. You're able to, to, to fight and be able to tell your story to another person. Because this is bigger than what you're going through. It's about helping out the next person who might be going through something similar to what you're going through right now. So, yeah. Be strong. Hang in there. And it's going to be okay. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that and for just being on the show. Thank you. Catch us for the next episode. It's Truth and Tea, filtering life through faith.